All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Fridays with Fiscal. Um, my name is Amanda, and uh, today we are going to be talking about um, a deeper dive into USAS report generation and best practices. I'm sorry my camera is so washed out, but <laughs> we're rolling with it. Um, okay. Let me make sure everyone is in here. Okay. We got a couple people still connecting. Okay, so um, what I what I want to talk about today is, you know, we we have had quite a few report trainings along the way, and um, you know, we try to talk about different things. There's a lot to talk about with reports. So what I want to focus on with this session is kind of a review of the different kinds of reports. The very first thing we're going to jump into is talking about canned reports versus template reports. Um, and then I'm going to take a look at actually generating some different reports and kind of talk through a couple of hot topics there that um, are things that we've had come up on tickets, uh, especially recently. So, so, you know, usually I jump into the wiki. We're going to come back to this. I'm going to actually just go ahead and start right in the software. We still got some people joining up, so I'm going to take a pause before we get too far in here. Okay, so, so just to get us started, um, I wanna talk about template reports versus canned reports. And the interesting thing, especially with the when we're talking about the USAS side, like USPS started with a lot more canned reports, but with USAS, um, what we did, especially when the software was first starting, like the early waves and everything, um, basically, this grid in your report manager, you can see some on the home page if you favorite them. These are your template reports. In our initial waves of the application, we wrote pretty much all of the USAS reports as template reports. Um, there were a couple on that report menu, but uh, over time that's certainly grown. And really the benefit to the template reports is that they have so much flexibility and the ability to customize what you're seeing on the report, how it's filtered, um, how it's totaled. And so, you know, with having the possibility to have that kind of flexibility, you know, the initial goal was like, okay, let's get everything in there as this. And then that way, as people are adapting over from, especially a software like Classic that they were in for <laughs> a really long time and may have had a lot of variety of different reports, like this gave an avenue for, those reports to um, you know really get started in here. Now, what I want to do, uh, we're going to keep focusing on the template reports first. Is open one of these up, and I think we can just pick a random one. So um, when I'm in this report manager grid, and you know we're focusing on generation, so I'm not going to explain a bunch in here because this is like the actual customization of reports but I still wanted to open this up because um, what I want to focus on with this view is just the fact that this is the structure of the report. This is the framework. Every single template report um, in USAS like, is built on the same kind of framework. And so the basics are that you have this object which pulls in what fields and that, you know, is related in, in most cases to like a grid either that you see in the software or a grid that's kind of behind the scenes. This first tab, I think of if we are just doing like simple terms, simple, like this first tab is basically the columns I have on my grid. So here are my columns. The filters is how you determine what rows, like what data rows um, are included in there. And then the generate report, we have some other options. Obviously on these first two tabs, we have all these different options we're seeing within each thing we add. But the basic structure of every template report is, I'm selecting my columns, I'm filtering what rows I see. And then from there, we can add headers, we can add, totals and and every single different flavor of a template report has that same structure. So again, the really nice benefit with these template reports is that you can customize to get something very specific that you want. Um, 
now over time what we found is that the part that you know is more the pro of uh, is more like more a con of these is that um because it has so much flexibility to do anything some of the really big reports that you might want to run using this this structure this template structure isn't the most optimized and so that's when we get into looking at some of the canned reports that were rewritten so it was a template report first and now there's a canned version um that's because with those canned reports it it can hone in on knowing just the one thing it needs to do versus being built on this structure that can do anything or that can do a lot of things rather so so just to kind of get an idea for for how these template reports are set up and if we go back you know if i were to click into any single one of these template reports and click this eye icon we're going to see that same grid and we see that grid a lot right like we like i know we've been in there before on trainings but you know just to think about that concept of like all of these different look at how many different styles of reports um, then they can customize and share those with each other. And um, so, you know, ultimately like a really great thing, it's just a matter of the different um, kinds of reports having different benefits. Uh, let me see, make sure I got everything with that. Okay, so then canned reports, when we're talking about those, this is our reports on our menu. Now, these ones, if we go into, you know, any one of these reports, the generation page looks kind of similar. We have the same elements in here where we can um, choose things when we generate, but we're not able to go in and see that like little background view of it. And the reason why is because it's actually programmed in. So, you know, it's actually um, set up in the software to specifically run this specific report. and. Um, you know, while that doesn't have the same ability to like customize as with the template report, there is a huge advantage that we've found with the performance. So especially in a situation, and we're going to be looking at this one later where we're running for a full fiscal year, especially in a situation if it's a large district, if it's a large date range, the these reports have the ability to pull the data so much faster. Um, the financial detail report is like 99.99% faster. And so what I'm going to do is kind of jump in here. We'll look at some different generation options. But, you know, I know that especially districts that were maybe on in early waves, they have a lot of customized uh, template reports. Like they may be very used to running those template reports. You know, they, they always use the financial detail on the grid. So why would they change it up? And I understand that, um, but especially at the ITC, like if you have someone coming to you that's trying to get a year long, like a full fiscal year, and it's one of these reports that's been rewritten, something that you can do to immediately help them is make sure they're running this canned version, because if they aren't, that would be a huge difference right away. <laughs> so um, so yeah, so those are, those are really helpful when it comes to um, generation speed. Okay, so, uh, and then let me go back to my home page here, because all of these reports, I believe I got them all, I kind of went through and, and uh, checked them, so I, I think I got everything here, but all of these different reports that we're seeing on the home page, uh, you can, these are the template versions, and these are available as canned reports. So um, there's an audit report here, let me open this up too. So there's an audit report on here, your uh, budget account activity and the revenue account activity, those are both in this account activity report. We have the disbursement detail report, budget summary, um, and then financial detail. You can get all of these different versions. The purchase order report, we're gonna talk about this one later, but important to note that it does replace the purchase order detail, but also the outstanding purchase orders. So out, this outstanding purchase orders report is very helpful, the template one, um, but we made sure that we put that functionality in the canned one because that template one is one of the ones that takes a long time. So um, definitely this outstanding purchase orders, um, you know, 
it's it's way way better if, if you use this one and we'll talk about the outstanding option um a little bit later here and then uh revenue account activity is in the account activity okay so um the other reason that i bring this up and you know obviously like uh, this is something we've talked about before where we have like these, you know, um, canned reports that kind of replace it and like, you know, it's definitely a transition and there's definitely, you know, situations like if they do have customized versions of these reports, then they may still be wanting to use the template versions. And I do understand that. Um, you know, my understanding is our goal really is to try and transition them over and get everything that they may need into these canned versions. So, you know, we're not going to take away the old versions because we don't want to break anything that, you know, they have set up as far as like customized or anything that anybody needs. But the team has been looking at things recently. Um, I mean, over time, but recently too, the last couple months, we had some updates which is why I wanted to talk about this. Um, but we've been making sure to add certain things to these canned reports to make sure that they can be used instead. So, um, you know, so definitely a thing where um, there's the performance benefit, but also just like getting used to to using these. Like the idea is that they will transition over. So especially when we're looking at things like if your districts are um wanting something uh like basically for like future enhancements for the future enhancements we're mostly looking to add things to the canned reports we're not necessarily going to continue improving the template versions of those reports now that we have the canned report um that said i know that we um have made some improvements uh especially over the last couple of months with the excel versions which we're going to talk about um in detail here next but uh there are some other things like if there are things that come up and your districts are saying um that you know there's something that they don't have available on that canned version um that they need outside of like customization essentially but you know if there is something if there's like a specific process that they would use those for that they can't let us know i know we have some enhancement requests in for like the filtering to um kind of change allow for wild cards in that so um it's something we're looking at it's something the team is you know has again they've been doing those over the last couple months even too so it's something that we want to make sure um has what they need so that they can get the benefit of that uh better performance and i see i got a question can you uh you can add canned bundles or i'm sorry canned reports to report bundles right you can you can um let me see i think oh i have to remember but i'm pretty sure that we have them listed in the documentation report report bundles Here we go. So um, they they can definitely be added. The names are a little bit similar to the template versions. So um, you just want to make sure you uh, pick the right one. I believe uh, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, I think these ones have all have like report, but these are the names um, here as they appear when you go to add them to the bundles. So uh, this was on the report bundle documentation page. We're also going to talk about save and recalls at one point, and um, if you do have any save and recalls, that can also be really helpful to finding the version that you want uh, when adding to the bundle. Okay. All right, so let's jump in and look at one of these reports. So I'm going to go to the account activity report. This is one that we have um, enhanced recently, um, just kind of cleaning it up and making sure that uh, some of these different versions are the same as what's available with the template version. So um, what we're going to do, I want to run this as, oh, actually, you know what, before I jump into running, let's look at this more specifically. So save and recall, we'll get back to that. This one has the account activity type. 
So it's the account activity report, but this replaces budget account activity and the revenue account activity. So all I have to do is say if I want the budget or revenue. So we're going to do budget. Um, and then my start and stop dates, I enter those in. I have my report format here. So I have PDF. And then if I want to filter, I could enter a specific fund in here, uh, function object. Uh, this is the part I mentioned. Um, it, it is just one for now. Um, but we do have an enhancement request, I believe, to add the wild cards uh, ability to add to use wild cards in here. And then uh, filters as well. We'll do an example of that in a little bit. Um, it's hard because all this stuff is so intertwined, but I don't want to get ahead. <laughs> so uh, show report options is also something that we're going to talk about. Let's see. You know what? Let's let's go ahead and do that. We'll do that show report options now and then summary report. Um, I'm going to skip for now. But what we're seeing on this side is going to be the way that the report is sorted. And this is, um, it defaults here to have the cash account be the first like header and control break. So it's the subtotal and then by account code. And if we wanted, um, we can on this report, we do have the ability to pull over, um, you know, a different option to have like our headers and subtotals. And you know what, let me just go ahead and generate this first. Um, let's like just look at the standard one. Okay. Well, I was hoping something would happen there and it didn't. So um, one thing I would put this as a note, if especially if you have a district that is using the template version and they might come over and start using this canned version. We have had reports that the first time that they run this in their instance, they may get a pop-up blocker. And so it would be up here in um, the URL. And so this is why I have a screenshot. Move this around. This is why I have a screenshot. So, oh. but it's right up here. Look, I can mark. It's right up here in the top corner. And let's see if we zoom, it lets us scroll. There we go. So it's right up in the URL. It'll have this little icon here. Um, and I believe we have this noted in the wiki as well, if you need to refer to it there. But basically they just click on this and it'll let them choose to always allow it. And then anytime they run this report afterwards, it'll not be an issue. But I know we've had some people run into that just the very first time that they try and run this. Okay. Uh, so, but mine ran. So let me go ahead and open this up. I guess that doesn't make a difference. I'm losing my life, but it's okay. Um, all right. So first, we'll come back to this options page. So first, uh, just to show our what we chose here, we had our headers was cash account and then by account code. And for each of those uh, different sort options, it's also going to subtotal it. So we have a subtotal for each account code. And then if we were to scroll down here, we'd have a subtotal for each cash account as well. Now, um, if you wanna change this, so let's take out account code and let's do, um, I have the forecast line number on here. And I could do a control break by that. And so now see, I have my cash account still because I left that one on there. But now for each forecast slide number, all of my activity is um, organized together. And then I have the totals um, associated with those on the report as well um, for like a subtotal.
Um, and then you have all these other options as well. So, um, oh, and then, okay. So then let's talk about our options page because um, one thing that that comes up is, um, you know, sometimes when you get a question about their reports, like uh, balancing or not balancing, um, sometimes it can be due to just simply how the report was run. And um, if that's the case, then one thing that can be really helpful is if they have the report, if, if the report that they run has this report options page, that gives you a direct insight to like the options that they chose when they ran it. So in this case, we can see start stop dates, and then we can see that this was filtered to a specific fund. Um, so that really helps. The other thing, even if you don't have the report options page to look out for is um, up here, we have the reporting period. Um, some reports have the start and stop dates in this top corner as well. And then the timestamp. The timestamp is really helpful, especially on reports that are showing, you know, like activity, like actual transactions. If something might have, like maybe a report was run before something was entered. So those are all really important things to note. Um, just as far as looking at the report generate options. Okay. Let me see. Sorry, I'm trying to get my light to stay on here. One moment. There we go. There we go. So all right, so then what I want to do is I want to run this as um, an Excel data. So this report particularly, uh, this budget account activity report is one. We've we've gotten tickets over time, we've gotten a lot of tickets over time where um, certain third parties are looking for a transaction listing of like all of their budget activity and all of their revenue activity. And um, like my understanding is that they were wanting districts uh, to run that template version because there were actually some additional fields in there that represented like the, you know, these like um, OPU one digit, object one digit, uh, you know, they were kind of like the fields that we really just had on the template report so that they could be used with the sort. Like it was just a um, when we added them to the template report, they were suppressed fields so that they could be sorted on, but like by result, they were on that Excel sheet and we figured, you know, people are using them if they want, like they might just be deleting them. Um, but what's interesting is that they were actually being used for another purpose. So when we had first created these canned reports, like we left out the stuff that we didn't think was was necessarily being used or needed. So when we found out those were being used, we added those back to the Excel data um, version on this canned report. So if you do have districts that are setting things up to run monthly, um, you know, they have like a third party that's requesting um, like basically budget transactions or revenue transactions, uh, they should be able to use this canned version because the Excel template, uh, I'm sorry, the Excel data, um, we have that set up. So I believe it's exactly the same as what they would be able to generate with the template version, but much quicker. Uh, our, I think it was last month's release recap. We had um, an issue that we talked about where, um, like a JIRA issue that was completed, where we had further performance enhancements to this report. So this has gotten quicker even just in the last couple months. Um, so let me get that open. I should not wait for my Excel though. <laughs> And okay. Mm -hmm. Let me get bring this over so you can see it. There we go. All right. Now, once they get it in Excel, just like a couple quick things I want to show. First of all, we want to enable editing. And then I have a couple little tricks is, you know, some of this like formatting doesn't look um. You know, it's a little bit stretched out because of like how it comes over into Excel. But what I'm going to do to fix this really quick and easy is I'm I have my cursor on this arrow that's in the top left and that's a select all. So I've just selected everything. 
And then if I put my cursor on any of these, like between the columns where I get the line with the two arrows, and all I'm going to do is double click. And what that does is that fits all of my any of my columns to the data that's within them. Um, so again, I'm going to do this now on my left side. And so I'm just right under where that first row is and just double click. And boom. So that was just you're just hovering like right on the line between the columns. And then I can click anywhere to uh, get it unselected. But so, you know, that's like a quick trick where, you know, if that's something where they, you know, they don't like how it how it looks, you know, a couple seconds. Once they get that down, that will be um, an easy fix. Another thing is, um, and we might have a Jira issue for this, but I'm not really sure if this is Excel um, or if this is how it's coming over, but um, I noticed some of these like transaction numbers have these commas in it. And this is also something if they see any of these columns and they want to clean it up, I'm just selecting this column and then um, it looked a bit different when I'm zoomed out. Hang on. Let me, let me just, okay. Yeah. So, so look at, I, uh, I'm sure that this is in, okay. So it's actually in styles. So usually I'm used to looking at this where it's zoomed out. So I select this and then look at normal is right here. Boom. So two clicks and I can fix that. Let me see if I have any check numbers. Here we go. So this is the check number column. So I'm just clicking a select all and then I'm clicking normal. So uh, yeah, so I guess that would be cell styles if you're in this zoomed in view. It's in the cell styles. I got uh, <laughs> I got um comfortable with my Excel windows. I don't actually look at the boxes. Um, all right, and then the other trick I want to show while we're in here, um, because I know you know Excel is a whole nother beast, but sometimes it's helpful if they're going to be using these reports. Just know a couple of these quick tips. Um, let me see, and then so um, if I go up here, I'm going to do sort and filter, and um, if I click on filter. It adds these, see these drop downs. It adds that to every single column in the first row. And then what I can do from here is so I have type. So if I want to say, look, I don't want the PO records in here, boom. Now I have everything but POs that were on this report with just a couple clicks. So I know that sometimes that's intimidating um, if users like aren't as comfortable in Excel. But I would say, you know, some of those quick like um, tips like this, I, I wanted to show because if they are, if it is a matter of, you know, being able to customize a, a template report to do that versus just being able to, you know, run the report, um, if, if they're running, especially if they're running it to something like Excel, uh, you know, then it's like the time they're going to save in the generation is worth just being able to just filter it, you know, or is worth just taking the time to filter it, I guess. It's, it, it weighs out where I think it's still much uh, quicker for them um, if they do it that way. Andrew asks a good question. Would the commas get added to the CSV version of this report? I don't believe so. I think this is an Excel formatting thing. I think it's how Excel is looking at it once it comes over in here. Um, we can go ahead. We'll run it in CSV just to make sure, but I'm like, fairly certain. Uh, if we open it in Excel, again, we might see them, but we're going to look at the, we'll look at the actual data file. Let me pull it up here. Actually, I'll do both. I'm going to open it in Excel. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So CSV, look, we don't see it. Wait, is this? Yeah, let me make sure I'm looking at the, oh yeah, yeah, this is a new one. So it doesn't show um, when it opens in Excel for CSV. And then, yeah, yeah, oh no, but, but I think I opened the wrong one. Um, 
Yeah, I know that can be scary. And that's why I think it, and that's why I think with the Excel data version, like, I don't think that it's, because, I mean, it's not actually in the data, right? Like, it's not actually when you look at those, those um, transaction numbers in the software, like, they don't actually have commas. Excel likes to make a lot of assumptions when you pull something in there. So, sorry, this looks like a mess when we're looking at it, but basically, I, we're just looking right here and see, you know, in the data set, like, these definitely don't have commas. So, so, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, so while we're here, so, you know, okay, so we got distracted on all the Excel, um, Excel tricks there, but really what we also want to look at here is let's scroll over a bit. So when I'm talking about these like extra fields, um, I have fund function. So, um, we have the account code, you know, as a whole is what would usually be like kept on transactions. Like if you look at any purchase order or disbursement, like the field you see is the full account code with the dashes in it. But on this report, so you have a column with that, but we also have a column with each individual account code piece. And this can be helpful. Like, you know, if they're like, okay, I just want to see this one certain building. I just want this one OPU. Then they could filter on this and see everything just for that OPU by using these filters that we added. And then this also has the forecast line number, which I think that's what, I think the forecast line number and then having like these function one digit and two digit were things that um, we had, you know, kind of heard that there were third parties using. So, so yes, all of those extra columns. And, you know, the nice thing is like, if they're not using it for that purpose and they just want a clean, you know, sheet, all they got to do is select those and delete them. Boom, you know. So, uh, so yes, so lots of options there. Uh, let me close out of this. No, we're not going to save it. Okay. And uh, I also want to look at this. Uh, I, I'm glad we covered the CSV too. That worked out. Um, I, I'm going to look at the other Excel version um, just quickly here. Rhonda says an Excel report tips and tricks to make a great Friday's with fiscal session. Hmm, we'll talk about it. Um, I do like the idea. Um, you know, Excel's just <laughs> such a beast sometimes. And um, you know, there's a lot to it. Like I, you know, we can we can certainly talk it over because I'm sure there's things that we've, you know, personally learned along the way that we can try and convey. So I like it. I like it. Um all right, so here, let me see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. Uh, so uh, basically what I did, so this is like the normal Excel version, not the Excel data. So when we're running the normal Excel version, like it's not giving us like, you know, a, a data sheet that we can use the filters and the sorts on in the same way. But it gives us like, basically it's giving you the data, how it kind of looks formatted, um, like similar to the PDF report, but it has the ability to edit. So I'm not sure, on, especially on account activity report when they would use this, but maybe on some of the other ones, like a budget summary, cash summary, um, you know, this kind of gives them like, if it's something that they want to make slight adjustments and then print out, they could use this version. So I just wanted to show this. I feel like, you know, this one, since a lot of times when they're doing Excel, they're, they are looking for Excel data. So I feel like this one got a little overlooked um, for a bit, but, you know, it can be helpful. So that's what that looks like. So um, let's see, I'm going to switch over to our financial detail report now and look at that one. Again, this looks pretty similar and I am zoomed in here. Let me zoom out a bit because we have the, um, 
we have the report options, we have the filters they can enter here. And then again, we have um, the sortable properties. I believe the sortable properties are good on this one too. I will say um, when it comes to those sortable properties, the budget summary, the, the canned budget summary does have a bug right now that we intend to fix where you can't do the, um, how we pulled over like the forecast line number. So the budget summary is the one that I know um, it's not working with right now. So, but hopefully we can get that fixed soon. Um, so, all right. So when we're looking at the financial detail report, now I mentioned when we were on that homepage, we had all the ones it replaces and let's just do this. Let's let me open another window here. Close a couple of these. So these are the reports it replaces. So what I want to show, what I want to talk about is this financial detail report with July 1 cash balances, because that one is kind of specialized, right? Like the financial detail report has all of the um, expenses and receipt transactions and kind of runs through those. But this one has the headers where it has the cash balance on top. So um, when we're doing this, the important thing to note is that um, if you are running it for the current fiscal year, that's when you will get those cash balances. So um, in this case, my current fiscal year is July, 2023. So if my dates are July 1, 23 to 6, 30, 24. So um, since I'm starting um, at the start of this fiscal year, when I run this, let's take this out. We'll talk, talk about those in a minute. When I run this, I will see in this top header, the initial balance. And then I have to scroll all the way to the bottom and go to, and then you'll see, so obviously these are different funds because I just hopped hop to the bottom, but here we go. See, there's initial and ending. Um, so, uh, what what's important about that is that those are cash balances. So when you think about the cash account itself, uh, if you're looking at like, here, let's go to the cash account. And this is the same with the um, the template report as well with initial balances. But I know it's something that, um, you know, sometimes you just gotta um, like think through because. Um, when they're looking at those, like depending on what they're running it for, especially the template report, they can run different uh, date ranges. But so uh, let me pull this up here and show you what I'm talking about. So the initial cash is what's going to show in that field. And the initial cash is always going to be the start of the fiscal year. So basically what happened, what we did with the um, with the canned version of this report is we had it show specifically when it was relevant. Um, so that, so it shows for, oops, sorry. So it shows for, you know, when we're looking at these transactions for the fiscal year, it's showing you, okay, here's the start. Here's what it started at. Here's what it ends at. Um, now when you're running this report, you can do different date ranges. So we have our start date, we have our end date and these dates do not impact what would, well, other than whether it shows or not, like it's never going to be, um, any like balances, any year to date, any initial balances on any of the reports, like aren't tied to start and end dates. Those would be tied to a total as of period. So if we stick to the context of this report, financial detail, I'm seeing all my transactions and see how these all have a date for them. So this one, this was, you know, something that happened. This was expended on 7-15 that is within the date range, so that is included. And then the totals here are just adding up all of those different um, transactions. Now, if we had a report that's like a budget summary report, this is where, um, and I think I, I think I have this set up, I just run it.
we did run it for everything. Um, so what I did, I just ran this without choosing like an as of period. So it's running as of my current period, um, whatever my current period in my software is. But I could choose a different as of period if I wanted to have my totals as of a different month. And uh, once we get this report up, we'll talk about um, those totals a little bit more. Kind of sidetracking here, and I uh, usually this long. Like, of course, the one that I didn't run ahead of time now is. <laughs> uh, let's go. I probably should have run anything else. Well, let's see what else we have to talk about. Okay, so we talked about the initial cash balances. Um. So yeah, and you know, I've talked in the past about um, transaction-based reports versus account-based reports. So transaction-based reports, again, is where we kind of see all the individual transactions listed out. So, you know, again, like we can see these dates, but also look at this has um, a purchase order number. You know, this has, what is this? Um, the receipt number. So this is like listing out all of the transactions to add up to those totals. Um, where when we look at something like a budget summary, that's going to um, just have like year to date. So um, really, and that's really my point of just on the fly trying to run that one is to show that it has fiscal year to date. It's got um, month to date totals. And so when you're looking at something that would be the as of period, it's because that's applying to like, well, when I'm looking at month to date, so if I want to know, you know, what month to date do I want? leave it blank, it's the current month, right? It's the current period. But you could easily just go ahead and choose a different as of if you wanted to see what the month to date was for last month. So that's all I wanted to mention with uh, there. And okay. And then, you know what, I'm just going to move on from this one. And let's go to, let's go back to our financial detail. Now, um, and I know, I, I think this came up in in um, one of our other trainings too, when we had mentioned uh, this report. Now you can do these filters. So like if I wanted to just filter on like a specific fund and, you know, function, I could put it in there. Um, if I wanted a full cash account, I could enter my filter there. I do have the ability to include like a full account code. Um, or exclude a full account code. And this would be like, um, I'm just going to copy this. This would be like the entire account code. The entire account code with the dashes, if I wanted to include or exclude and have this be just for a specific account, I can do that right here from the basic parameters. Um, but I do know that sometimes, like, and a lot of times, like, they might want it to be more complex than that. And so we have the option for the filter here. And I know, like, I, I definitely understand that this is an extra step where, you know, they need to go in and make an account filter um, to run something. But um, I want to talk about this again in the sense of these canned reports run so, so, so much faster. So I know that it you know, even if it is something where it's like, okay, instead of just typing it in here, they need to go type it into the filter, or like make a filter um, or that kind of thing. But there really still can be a benefit because um, first of all, just the time they're going to save on the report generation. But um, let me show this. So if I have one, uh, actually, let's go look at our account filter. So I set up one and I called it reports. So if I have this filter, so I set this up and I said, okay, let's let's get a couple different funds. Um, let's restrict to a couple different funds here. And the first row that I have, let me just zoom in a little bit, make sure we can see this. So the first row that I have, I did, um, so the TI of zero is a cash account. So I did all cash accounts, so like all funds that start with five. And I put my wild card in here because like, say that's what I want to do. I wanted to make sure I could use the wild card. Now, in this case, 
Um, the five has read only access. So that will be included in my report. I have another line on here for the four, six, seven, but honestly, I'm not using that right now. So I don't have any access assigned. So it's not going to include that. So we're going to leave it like this for the first time we run this report. Let me go back to financial detail. So let me come down here and do reports. Generate that. And boom. So now look at my account codes. They're all starting with five. Sorry, I should have been zooming in these reports too. Um, so, so that filtered it to just my 500 uh, funds. Now, say I want to come in here, but I'm like, okay, wait, now I also want to add that 400 fund that we, that we had on there. So if I come and edit, I want to make that, I'm going to add the read only on there. Save it up. Boom. And then, you know, I didn't test this without refreshing. Usually I would refresh this page. Let's gonna give it a go on the fly and see. We might need to go back and refresh, but we'll, just, we'll test it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is it. No, we didn't even need to refresh. Look at that. So basically the filter, like, because if you just um, go ahead and um, have, you know, like one filter, and, you know, some things like if it's a really big, complex filter, like sometimes there's uh, like with inserting lines and stuff, I know we have some improvements to make there. So, you know, kind of figure out what works um, for them, like based on what they need. But this is an opportunity, right, to like be able to have some simple, simple filters that they might just use and then can go update um, to make it a little easier. The other thing that I would say, so just, sorry, just to scroll down here a little bit more is we have the 400, the 467, and then we still have the five, uh, 500 funds for that filter. But, um, but what I would say is that, you know, it kind of depends on how they might want to utilize these filters. And I see an opportunity here where, you know, I'm I'm sure that there are some times where there's like a specific thing they're trying to run the report for and see, or they're trying to find this thing, or they're trying to look at this thing. But I feel like a good amount of things that they may be using these for, like, could be common things. Like, if they're looking to filter and see for a specific building, um, if they're looking to see for athletics, or you know, like if there are things like that that they may use more than once like it's that it's a it's always going to be that same group of of you know accounts with maybe some slight changes once they build the account filter um you know so you here's cafe like for the cafeteria once they build that account filter they could use that on any of their reports um the other thing is that these account filters can be assigned to users so like say they have a high school filter and then all their secretaries in the high school have that, they can also use that on their reports. So if it is something that they already have created a filter for before or that a user has, like they don't have to recreate the wheel on that. They can just use the existing filter. So I know that's a little bit different though. Like I know that's a little bit different thinking than what they're used to with just being able to like type in some of those filters, but I do see that like, if it's something, you know, I think that there could be some really uh, practical ways to be able to use that where, you know, especially once they get some of those ones in there, you know, they may be able to just use them versus having to, you know, I don't expect that they're going to have to come create a unique filter every time. Um, and just to show this is I know my names are all over the place here because this is a test instance. But the canned reports, so the template reports have this field where they can use a filter, but an improvement with the canned reports is that they actually get the list. So if they don't remember exactly what all of their filters are called for high school, like they can scroll through here and say like, okay, you know, and again, I have a bunch of random names for my test instance, but, but they can scroll through here and say like, oh, you know, wrong what? Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. <laughs> 
So, uh, so it gives them that list, which is really nice. Okay. Um, so the other thing here is the save and recall. Um, and I want to make sure that we talk about this real quick is the save and recall up here. And, you know, I feel bad because I see I'm running um, towards the end of our time and there's something else I want to talk about. And I feel like this one is rough because, you know, the save and recall, I think, is so useful. But we always like just get to touch on this like, a, oh, and by the way, they can do the save and recall. Right. So uh, basically what they're doing here is so say I have this filter in, I have my certain stop dates in. Um, if I come up here and pick like a blank. Then I could say, let's call this one what? Because our filter was like wrong, what? <laughs> so we'll call that what? As soon as we tab off of this, we have the ability to save it here, right? So now anytime I come in to my financial detail report, I can have this in my list. And when I pick this, it's going to remember what dates I had, what report format I had, and any filters that I had in there. It's gonna remember all of these options. So if there's something that I run, say I run this once a month, like I can just do it as a save and recall, and then that would help me just pull it right back up. So look, I have an example save in here, and I could easily just kind of like filter through these different options that I've saved. So say like every month, I know I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna run the save and recall for the high school and I've got certain parameters that I put in. Um, so, you know, even one step easier than remembering what filters to pick, they could really just have everything already pre-configured. Now, the save and recalls are per user. So I'm logged in as the admin account. When I save these save and recalls, it's gonna save under the admin account. If another user logs in and goes to the financial detail report, they won't have my what in there. Like they won't have this specific save. They'll have anything that they've saved. So it is per person. It's like your own personal little library <laughs> of how you like to run reports. Um, the other thing that makes this really helpful, and it kind of came up earlier with the report bundles, is if I'm coming in here to create a report bundle, um, when I go to add a report, okay, so here's my financial details. Um, and I have a couple, see, and this is where, but, but here's where we're gonna find out real quick, right? Because we have these different financial detail reports and look at, I picked this one. And when I pick this one, look at this, my options name, there's there's my what <laughs> maybe I should have named that differently <laughs> but um but the save and recall that I had for that canned report is now showing up so if I I can add this to my report bundle and when I go look at this when I open it up here see based on what we're seeing here with this formatting we can tell that this is the canned report and look at here's that filter that I chose and so now not only did I set those options up and save it for myself to run any time, I now can have it added in this report bundle. And then if I wanted to schedule that or, um, you know, or even have this with some other reports to run immediately, then, then that makes it easy. So that's kind of a little trick, especially with some of these ones that have similar names with the canned reports is uh, give yourself the save and recall to, uh, to, to see in there. Okay. All right. So uh, before we go, um, I want to talk about this purchase order detail report. And we get a lot of questions on this, especially with the different statuses. Um, but basically, so this report is, um, it's going to run your, your purchase order information. So it'll show um, all of the purchase order basics. But where this comes up a lot is, um, or one of the uses, you know, I'm sure that there are times where they want to see like all for a specific date range. But um, a lot of times this is used because when you are balancing to your accounts, like your uh, budget summary, you would have, oh, here, let's, let's open that budget summary that we ran now. 
me go all the way to the bottom here. Boom. So we have our encumbrance column. And so this is the remaining encumbrances on each of these accounts, right? And so here's our full remaining encumbrances. Now, when I look at these here, let me grab one of these accounts. So let me zoom in and make sure you can see this. So grab an account. But so here's our encumbrance column. So all of this, if I went to any of these account codes, like this is what it would show is the remaining encumbrance on this account. And now obviously this is just a total. So if I wanted to see, okay, well, what makes up that remaining encumbrance on the account, you're going to want to know the outstanding. And um, we'll come back in a minute and talk about the difference here, but let me just show you full account codes. Let's, let's run this. So I just plugged in one of those account codes that we saw in our budget summary so that we could just hone in on one account. Okay. So now this is a thousand dollars. So we have, okay, boom, here is our purchase order. It's the, it's just one item on that PO that was for that account code. And then that's where my thousand remaining encumbrance is coming from. Now you'll notice this says current period remaining encumbrance. So one of the big important things is that this is based on the current period of the software up here, this July, 2023. Um, when I was talking about the as of period on some of the other reports, the PO report is the exception. Whenever you are running for outstanding, whether it's on the template or if you or when you're using this Canva version, it's always going to be based on the actual current period up here. So you can change the current period if you need it for like a prior month. Um, say like they're closing, you know, but they they're closing the last month, like, and they can temporarily change back current. Changing current doesn't require reopening, so um, they don't have to reopen a period. Uh, to get that. They just make it current. And you know what? Let's let's look at that real quick while we're in here. So the green highlighted one is current and I could change it to a different like current period by just checking. Okay. This will make it current, but you'll notice uh, once this reloads, but you'll notice like this still is not open. It's still closed see open false current true so now if i ran um one of these po reports it would be um it would show what was outstanding what purchase orders had outstanding encumbrances in december but let's flip back here now where this becomes a little bit more important is um, when we're looking at, you know, so sometimes like see in this case, we have July, but really we have August out there too. And this can be something like, especially to keep in mind if they're like closing that prior month. So I'm still in July. So my report is going to look at POs that were open for by the end of July. But if anything's been paid in August, like if anything's been closed in August, like it might, it, it, it was open in July, but it's not open in my current software or in my current, like it's not actually going to be open once we get to August. So that's where it gets a little bit confusing. Um, the other thing is that, uh, here, let me get back to the report. The other thing is this invoiceable. So we have um, invoiceable or outstanding. And let me get to a, an actual purchase order. I have an example. So if we look at this purchase order right here, and sorry, I know it's a little bit grayed out, but what invoiceable is looking at is it's looking at this checkbox right here that's under the summary, that invoiceable checkbox. And if I look at this purchase order, that is not checked. It is not invoiceable. They cannot go ahead. They can't make another invoice against this purchase order. And the reason for that is because a full invoice exists. So anything that anytime there's, um, if the PO like item has 
a full status or a cancel full status because you can't do like a partial you can't do a partial invoice you can't do another full like after there's a full invoice that's no longer invoiceable um however the difference is that sometimes you might see remaining encumbrances and the reason for that is because look at this has a payable amount payable means it's sitting out here in our payables still so if i go here and i go here that's one of these transactions out here now how the software works with encumbrances is so it, it gets that invoice so it says okay well you you've invoiced this so you said you're going to pay it so i'm not going to let you add more invoices because you said that you're you're done paying on it however the step where the payables actually get posted to a disbursement that is the step where the encumbrances are no longer there and the expenses are added so it's just a matter of timing on those steps sometimes so you got to watch out for that um so in this case let's let's also look at it on the activity ledger because sometimes that helps too so in this case um we had the purchase order 71 the invoice has been issued with the full status but we don't have a disbursement yet so it hasn't been turned into an expense now I know that that's a bit confusing when you're looking at it from the purchase order perspective, but if we go back to to talking about these reports, it's not actually going to change the encumbrance on the account to an expense until it's posted as the disbursement. So because of that, that's why it's valuable to have this outstanding report still be able to reflect those encumbrances because they would still be on the account so it all comes back to balancing so um in, and so outstanding that's the, the last note i want to make is that outstanding is going to be um any time it has the remaining encumbrances as of the current period um and then, and basically that outstanding is what you want to match to um, the accounts, to like any account-based report, like a cash summary, a, um, a budget summary, the remaining encumbrances on there for that same period, for that same posting period as, you know, whatever the current was when you ran this. Invoiceable is basically just going to give you a list of can another invoice be issued on it? This one, the invoiceable is not based on the current period. So like if there's an invoice that exists for it, even if it's three months out, like from where your current period is, like it still is going to just say, is that checkbox? When we looked at the PO and we saw that invoiceable checkbox, is that checked? Yes or no, is what this invoiceable is doing. So I guess I should run this real quick, just for good measure um yeah and so so this so picking this outstanding status and look at that was i just ran it for everything and it completed just like that that this um parameter right here this outstanding is what replaces um the ssdt outstanding purchase orders so simple as that um and we come down here ah yes so some of these yeah so my test instance has some odd data we have i'm sorry i know some of those had zeros on it and i don't mean for that to be confusing we've seen we did have a report with that with like uh imported there was something with imported transactions so that is possible it's that um you can let us know i know we've had that reported before but in general you're gonna see just the outstanding ones here again you have your purchase order number and then it's saying, okay, here's how much is left. At, and then we go back to what we were talking about with our, you know, options. I can see, okay, July, 2023. So as of July, 2023, this is how much is remaining on this PO. Okay.
All righty. Um, well, that is all I have um, as far as, uh, you know, talking about these reports today. Um, there is honestly so much we could we could always discuss about reports. If you have questions, let me know. Um, thank you for the questions that we've had along the way. This was um, this was awesome, but um, I'll hang out for a minute. But um, if not, you know, uh, have a great weekend and thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next time.